Hey, Steph, you are known as Reva Star and you're such a talent in the house music scene. Thanks for joining us on the House Culture Podcast today. You're a DJ, artist and producer whose wickedest sounds have electrified dance floors across the globe. As founder of Snatch Records, you've been responsible for unleashing anthems from brand new talent and established legends alike. Someone who truly lives up to the mantra, eat, sleep, rave, repeat. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, can you, uh, I mean, we always want to roll it back at the beginning uh, on this show. So um, we want to go back to those early years. Uh, can you tell us about growing up in Napoli and how you discovered uh, music that you love there? Well, you know, um, I think, I guess it all started when I asked my mom to have a um, gaming computer. And she uh, firmly refused to buy that because she thought once you get in front of this uh, evil mechanism, you will stop doing things. So mm -hmm. she bought me a hi-fi tower instead, um, which was good for two reasons. First, uh, I had uh, the radio on there and there was a Saturday night live show from the biggest club in the south of Italy at the time, one of the biggest clubs connected with uh, Kiss Kiss Radio in Napoli uh, that then became a national radio. And uh, it was live from the club. It was one of the um, you know biggest parties in town. And uh, there were two DJs that were just live. And I still remember listening to their DJ sets playing, uh, I don't know, Your Love, uh, mm -hmm. and all that stuff from, you know, late eighties and, and stuff. And, um, and sometimes they were going live from the club. So you could listen to the crowd in the background and them just, you know, very excitedly talking about the records and, you know, people chatting and screaming. So I was totally fascinated by that vibe. And I was, I wasn't even 11, 10, 11 mm -hmm. years old, 12, maybe. Wow. Um, uh, so I got introduced into dance music through them. Obviously, mm -hmm. it was a very, a, a bit more of an open format, a more crossover vibe at the time. I remember there was uh, this remix from the, do you remember The Look by Roxette? Yes. Uh, yeah, there yeah, was yeah. this ele electronic remix of that. I was very fascinated because obviously I knew from MTV and stuff, you know, the original versions, but then I was mm. listening to this clubbier version with these tougher kick drums and drums and whatever. And, and, you know, I, you know, it was my entry level experience with dance music. And obviously the second good thing of the hi-fi tower was the, the turntable. So I yeah. could start buying vinyls. And yeah. uh, I remember I started buying my first 45, you know, the, the seven inches and then the, the 12 <laughs> inches with the first money from birthdays or whatever or if mm -hmm. someone knew it was so so normal to buy vinyl at the time it was the yeah. actual um media that people were listening to mostly um yeah. so yeah so i i started getting my approach into music with that sort of you know very clever gift from my mom <laughs> as, as if she knew where i was leaning to for, you know my next years and then yeah. from then I, I just started, I went to high school and um, I, uh, for my Holy Communion, I asked for um, two turntables. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were very uh, amateurish sort of turntables, very cheap, but it was enough for me to start trying things. And I, I didn't have much money at the time. So I was uh, buying, you know, a few vinyls and then, what I was doing is I was playing the original and then the instrumental with the a cappella of the B side and you know trying to make the most of all the vinyls, yeah, yeah. playing all the versions and stuff. <laughs> so we were doing the the high school parties and um, so yeah, I was introduced into you know with my friends into this kind of like party sort mm. of vibe and then from then there was a radio, local radio where I was going after school, still at the high school, taking with me my vinyls. It was a very local, popular radio that they were playing like yeah. traditional napolitan music so uh -huh. that, that is very popular there so by the time i was arriving there it was lunchtime so they were actually happy to you know to get the radio busy with someone uh whatever music he was playing so we were going in with club club stuff and i was even playing some rock and whatever i was into at the time i, I always listened to everything 
Amazing. Uh, yeah, so Amazing. I was keeping myself busy, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Using myself into the music stuff. Yeah, I mean, from a really young age as well, and like getting that that kind of education via the radio, and then buying physical copies on vinyl, and then you know leading through to kind of really just experimenting and mixing it all up um, together. I mean, what was what was the the club scene like there when you were kind of old enough to go out clubbing in that environment as well? What what was that like, and um, what kind of music was being played? Um. Funny enough, I've never been uh, a big club girl, girls mm-hmm. because I've been DJing since I was 13, 12. So yeah. I was actually playing in the clubs. But <laughs> the thing is that once I had my first electronic how early I was experience, experience and stuff, uh, and started doing the birthday parties, so even playing more commercial stuff. Or mm-hmm. I still remember I was playing the Gypsy Kings Mega Mix or the Grease <laughs> Mega Mix. You know, I was yeah. playing in these uh, villages for tourists during the summer. You know, like I was, you know, uh, finding my way around, trying to earn some money, paying my university studies and whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I totally fell into the more alternative world. So basically, till probably 2005 after Mm. that i never played or produced house music so i was a breakbeat hip-hop and drum and bass dj actually in the 90s i was playing in these huge parties in napoli like up to 3,000 people where i was playing from rage against the machine to the early chemical brothers or underworlds uh but the more breakbeatish stuff and i was all into the big beat and the early breakbeat in england so i've Mm -hmm. always been that sort of DJ uh, for a number of years, and mm. actually, my uh, after you know, also in the production on the production side, before Riverstar, I was running this project called Maddox, where uh, where I even had a track on Plump DJs, um, who were huge at the time on Finger Licking uh, yeah. on Plump DJs album. So we were doing this thing, me and Santos. Um, who is another great producer from Italy. So yeah. I wasn't much uh, into the house and techno scene at the time. I know there was a reality in Napoli and I was a, I know that was huge, but it wasn't really my crowd, my, my vibe. I was more into the alternative side of the, the city. And in the 90s, Napoli was amazing. You know, we had a yeah. cultural explosion, um, a lot of bands. And uh, I, I used to, to be dub master in a band, in a dub band. So, and... I was moved into the this alternative scene, yeah. fun enough. Probably yeah, that's that explains crazy. why I'm kind of a bastard in terms of sounds, even with <laughs> Riva, you know, you Yeah. I'm not a purist, I've never been and I will never be anyway. Will never yeah, be. it's I think it's great to have that kind of background in eclecticism and be influenced by all kinds of different things and bring those sounds within to your, your own sound. I think it's really important. I mean so what kind of made that change? How did you navigate that? You know, because obviously that's, you know, it's big beat breaks, drum and bass. It's, you know, that's not what you're playing kind of these days. What, how did that journey kind of start there for to get into more more house sound? Well, I suppose, you know, like every, every cycle, um, you know, everything went a bit more repetitive and boring, lack of ideas. Um, and to be honest, even when we were doing breakbeat, we were stamped as uh, plod steppers in a way because we were very housey in a way tum cha, yeah. tum cha, you know like so mm-hmm. um yeah around 2004 five there were early very interesting productions post break with productions like you know claude von stroke uh pulling from drum and bass with all the yeah. huge bass sound so basically the turning point was around 2005 because a lot of the break with producers moved to that, you know, very ugly, ele- big room electro sound, like yeah. very unlistenable, very unsexy. Uh, and I couldn't find my way around it. I, 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 I didn't like it. So, <laughs> and so when I heard all the Claude Von Stroke stuff and Jesse Rose and Switch and all that movement of Fidget House, it was so mm-hmm. refreshing for me um, because it was pulling from, you know, a break beat and drum and bass, but in the right way, if that makes yeah. sense. Uh, yeah. so I totally dived into it and, mm-hmm. and funny enough, my first release was as a star was on Dirty Bird. And yeah. at the time, Dirty Bird was probably the coolest and biggest label you could think of 
mm-hmm. as a first timer, you know, in that scene. So that I immediately put me on the map. So the yeah. first releases were on uh, um, uh, Dirty Bird and Front Room, which was Jesse Rose label, uber cool at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was like a one, two, it was like, oh, welcome. This is Riverstar. So yeah. basically from then on, which was around 2006 till 2010, when I had my biggest track, like on the commercial, uh, you know, circuit, mm-hmm. I was basically already doing like a hundred gigs a year, but just basically booked by myself. I didn't yeah. have an agent and something because those two releases really put me on the map as a cool producer, DJ, whatever <laughs> that means. <laughs> Um, so there was a good hype and uh, I had my 15 minutes in the underground. So I, I, I got a lot of gigs and I had the time to build up my sound. So, yeah. and the first releases, you could feel that that still was a bit of a brick with influence in it. You know, all the scratch and each stuff on uh, Southern Fried and, you know, the, the remixes mm-hmm. for Fatboy Slim and stuff. Whereas around 2008 is when I really switched to more house music sort of st- mm-hmm. sounds. And I did the release on uh, Get Physical, uh, Kindish, which was the sub label, and all you know that more the houseier labels. And from from then on, you know, I did I Was Drunk, which was a crossover breakthrough track for me. And yeah. from then on, you know, I never stopped. I, I started doing like almost 200 gigs a year for a, for a few years. It's too much, yeah. so I slowed down a bit. So I was a little bit late. <laughs> Um, and I did it slip ray repeat, of course, which is yes, even yeah, a of course, bigger yeah. um, stage in terms of exposure. And then I've, I've done my things with on and off, yeah. up and down, so that's everyone, I suppose. Yeah, that's that's insane. And you know, during that during that first kind of explosion period where you said it was like the one two um, from from Dirty Bird and, and Front Room, you know, like were you then booking gigs? I mean, were you already playing internationally? Um, yeah. anyway um, so suddenly there's a new persona a new persona you're still the same guy you know you're getting these gigs uh, on the on the back of uh, these big releases you know what were um, what were the crowds like in terms of um, accepting you as this new um, R- river star um, person that had um, you know delivered well, this new sound they- they didn't know. They didn't know I was Maddox back in the days. They <laughs> there was less uh, snobby attitude in terms of, yeah. you know, less social media mm-hmm. fastness. And uh, the only very strong social media at the time was uh, well, I'm not even sure it's a social media. It was MySpace, the mm-hmm. platform. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I was booking most of my gigs through uh, MySpace. I met Von Stroke through MySpace. You know, like wow. Jesse Rose, everyone. So mm. it was the best social media because it was a bit of everything all included in one, you know, like yeah. SoundCloud, Instagram, everything was, you know, on there. Um, mm-hmm. So I did everything through MySpace and then sometimes email, but mo- mostly through MySpace. And yeah, it yeah. was working fine for me. It was easier at the time. A bit yeah, less yeah. politics as well. Uh, and people were a bit more easygoing, I suppose, in terms of, you know, uh, influences and and it was yeah. a good time because it was after the big beat where everything was welcomed in terms of music style so there was still mm-hmm. a bit of that influence uh, yeah. and obviously also the fidget was very creative in terms of sound so yeah yeah i found I, I i still remember it as a very nice time for music where you could express yourself a, you know with less uh fear of getting judged up or you know banned or cancelled for whatever yeah. you yeah 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 it can be a lot more, people have got to be a lot more cautious these days with creativity which can, you know can can stop you kind of in the flow i, I mean not you did me. mention not me i don't care <laughs> well that's good to hear i mean you well, know it's... i just hey i just did a, a track in napolitan <laughs> keep going yeah why not okay. why not I, I mean you did mention um eat sleep rave repeat obviously that was in uh 2013 and, and you know working with fat boy slim um who we've spoken to to norman on the on this show as well and he's he, you know he's a massive hero of mine you know i'm sure you you've mentioned that big beat era that you were involved with as well i'm sure a massive hero to you i mean um you know how um how did that collaboration come about for you um, and what was it like working with, you know, Norman as a person and, and potentially one of your heroes as well? 
of course, he was one of my heroes. I had, you know, basically I found myself being uh, a huge fan of each of his projects, you know, from mm -hmm. House Martins, Beats International, Pizza Man, everything, everything he was yeah. doing. Then I eventually was finding out that he was him behind. I was like, yeah. this motherfucker yeah. you know, is behind <laughs> every track I like and he's giving me <laughs> inputs and creativity and stuff. So I need to find mm -hmm. a way to get in touch with him and whatever. Yeah. And as a, a stubborn Napolitan, I found I found my way to uh, uh, to him through the production. So I I started doing bootlegs of his tracks, and mm -hmm. then eventually uh, Southern Pride his label, you know, ended up signing signing them. And then I did an EP with them, and then eventually I got in touch with him because I asked if I got in touch, and he's super humble. He's one yeah. of the best people in the business. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you agree with me. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, the nicest and most selfless character, yeah. Uh, yeah. even considering his uh, stature, you know, in terms of in the mm. business. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I went to Brighton and uh, uh, he wasn't doing much at the time. And then we decided to do some collabs and then we ended up and he had, uh, this character called Birdman, who is an amazing, <laughs> talented uh, uh -huh. artist, uh, working a lot with his voice and uh, mm. doing beatboxing and, and everything. I was super creative. And then we ended up doing this track called Get Naked on my label on Snatch, mm -hmm. which yeah. for me was a super honor to have him on, on board. And then we did, because he was very well accepted and welcomed, we decided to do something more. And he was talking to me about this slogan, It Sleep, Rape, Repeat. Um, so he was keep mentioning it. I was like, oh, this must be something that we should put my, our head around it. And then uh, we came up with the idea of this three days banter of this guy gone around for, you know, farting or whatever. And mm. then we called Birdman. We gave him appointment at his place, but uh, uh, Norman's place in, uh, uh, in Brighton, but he was late, so he could stay just 15 minutes. I was like, okay, welcome. So we gave him a beer, uh, three minutes to put down the beer, and then he did 12 minutes freestyle uh, and left, which is the, you know, wow. part of that freestyle is what made the track. Yeah. Uh, but if you listen to the whole freestyle that we put up on SoundCloud, it's just amazing. He went all over the place, yeah. just changing voices. All the voices you see there, it's all him. No yeah. pitch wow. change or whatever. Yeah. It's all him just modulating. Yeah, and then the track stayed for for a year on our hard drives till um, he decided to put it on his mix mag CD, mm -hmm. um, and then you know the track stayed on our hard drive because we didn't know how to actually release it and make it credible. He was like, yeah. "Oh yeah, someone pretended to be on a bender and you know like pretended to be fucked up or whatever, going club by club and whatever." And then here is where the genius arrived. Norman said, why don't we pretend we build up a story where we pretend that we are outside some of Williamsburg's uh, record shop in New York and we find this, this guy totally off his head and we record him and we pretend that those vocals are the recording that we did in, in New York. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, it was yeah. like, this is genius. You know, people will, will buy this and will love this. And in fact, you know, it, it happened like that. And um, so we decided to release it. And then he was uh, touring with Calvin Harris on a private jet in Australia. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, Adam, Calvin Harris, ha happened to be a huge fan of his. And he asked to make a remix of it sleep. And he made a very uh, nice, considering, the, you know, how the EDM sound was yeah, at the yeah, time, yeah. very cheesy, Swedish, as Markish. So he made a banging big room electro um, um, ACD remix, yep. which is still played daytime on BBC Radio to this day. Yeah, to these days, and it was a huge hit. I remember in two weeks, everyone was playing it: Geta, Tomorrowland, and oh, everyone, everyone, everyone. Yeah, and it became such a slogan. Uh, the next year, I went to a WMC in Miami, and it was on every cup tea, t-shirt, <laughs> toilet cover. Everywhere you could, and to this day we have a we have a WhatsApp group, uh, WhatsApp group, um, uh, where we share you know all the pictures of people using the slogan like uh, Preta Manger or uh, you know everyone using yeah. and changing words but still using the the slogan, and it's fun. We collected almost like 
a hundred of pictures of people, even like wrestlers, yeah. uh, it's lit, <laughs> fight, repeat, you know, like <laughs> any, any sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's become such a slogan, like you say, it's so ubiquitous. It's almost like the text version of the smiley face to represent like the scene. It's, you know, it's really exactly. had such a cultural impact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was nice to see how it impacted the lifestyle as well. So mm. that's the part, and uh, and that's why nowadays I'm very uh, fascinated by the pop culture and the pop music and the way a song can actually enter into millions of people's lives. Sometimes even in influencing somehow, or even making the soundtrack of some special moments that will be forever in their lives. So mm -hmm. this thing for me is so fascinating. Um, and yeah, so that was a, a nice thing to see, to witness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's still, you know, it's still going to grow and change and like have this life of its own for forevermore. Um, for sure, I yeah. mean, what were you, you know, in terms of working with such a legend like Norman, was there anything that you felt that you taught him or that he, you know, what were your takeouts for yourself working with him as well? Oh, plenty, plenty of. Uh, uh, words of wisdom for, from him and also suggestions when I, you know, through the years when I had some doubts or I didn't know what to do on some stuff, I used to ask him as well. It's always been very kind and wise for me. Um, also, I learned a few tricks and he showed me all the old way, old school way of working. You know, he showed me all the diskettes from his sampler yeah. where he did Rockefeller Skunk and all that stuff <laughs> and the studio was still in the same shape as <clears throat> I, I knew from the pictures and his albums and uh, it was a nice touring of his villa. And also I, I pushed him into Ableton Live though. Because <laughs> 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 he was still working the old school way. Like, oh, I mean, all the tracks were made the old school way. Yeah. Uh, but I think It's Sleep was the first thing that was made on Ableton, which was nice to see. Well, well done, well done to you, bringing him into the new world. Well, I mean, um, I'm sure not just myself, but I was one of the the people yeah. who was actually saying, "Come on, come on, <laughs> make it but, a little bit easier for yourself." Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Snatch Records as well. Obviously, that's that's your label, and you started it up in um, in 2010. And you know, in terms of kind of the releases that um, have been a part of that, you know, something like your The Wickedest Sound EP, you know, it stayed in like the Beatport charts for like over eight months in back in 2017. I mean, it's something... Which is fun. It's fun because, you know, no, no one wanted to sign it. I didn't want to release it mm. on my label. I didn't, mm -hmm. They didn't want to sign it. It was like, oh, fuck it. I'm going to release it on the label. But... <laughs> that's that's incredible. And, you know, th these types of things as well, it's, um, you know, how are you measuring the success on that for you? Is it a case of it's got to um, have this many downloads or like reach this many people? Or is it just something that you're proud of and you've heard, you know, you've seen absolutely slay a dance floor, whether it's yourself or seeing someone else do it? What, what's success for you on that label? Uh, that's a nice question because in commonly success is even more nowadays, you know, how much of an impact you have on some Spotify plays or... Mm -hmm. uh, um, how many likes you have on a, on a social media post or whatever. Whereas I think success has a different value for each and every artist or person. And it's in people's eyes and perception. Uh, for me, success has always been something different. It's been the, uh, the way for me to get to people, the way... The, 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 even in the small things, like for instance, for this new track I've done in Napolita, I knew it was a difficult track and not uh, not suitable for several of the secrets that I usually deal with. Uh, but the amount of videos I've been receiving of people singing it on the beach, even like one of these fans' daughters singing it in an audio message with that cutie mm -hmm. voice, that's success for me because yeah. it means that I managed to get into people's hearts somehow. And mm -hmm. also success can be uh, that DJs really love to play. doesn't mean even, even if it's not a top 10 or it doesn't sell much, but it gets into the DJs that I really like, that I really rate, and, uh, and they use it as a tool. And then they tell me, this is the track when I'm in trouble in a, in a, in a party, you know, like that I yeah. pull up 
and play, pull out and play. And this is, you know, like, and success for me is when people say, oh, this has the river sound, you know, like, yeah, that's yeah. success for me, you know, like, so it's very different. From, and that that's the reason why I've always tried to push my independent career and mm -hmm. being as independent as possible with my own label for this sort of stuff, you know, like you do something different and then nobody buys it and but you still really believe in it and you release it by yourself and then maybe no one gives a shit it does nothing or it becomes like a big hit like you know big underground hit in a way like we got the mm -hmm. sound and it's it's fine either way because you know like uh for instance during lockdown there was not much not many reasons to do club club music because obviously people couldn't dance or whatever so i decided mm -hmm. to do more listenable stuff and i did this track with this jazz uh musician singer soul singer <clears throat> called gavin holligan and it was okay. a northern soul cover called if i could only be sure mm -hmm. so at the time everyone didn't know what to do with this track but now it's racked up for instance almost two and a half million plays on spotify which means that since lockdown till now it's been you know bubbling and getting to people's playlist and getting the, uh, his way its way into people's heart and and i i keep receiving messages on how nice is that song and we should do more so you know like there's several ways and sides to success and yeah um i really hope more people would would value success as a form of uh communication gone the right way rather than you know results 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 yeah you know? yeah and it's something you have to work for and put you know you, you you've got to pay your dues in a way and just like not expect it to happen instantly you know if you're passionate about something you, you know push it to the nth degree but you know things don't just necessarily happen overnight um i mean yeah you green know, velvet was saying you know uh you put so much effort on a track and you have great expectations and then it does nothing just you know don't don't kill yourself you know move yeah. on you know yeah. just you know keep doing because maybe the most unexpected tune could do you know way better and yeah. you put little effort in, you know like the best tracks i've done you know the i was drunk it was done in probably you know even an hour you know like yeah. i made the beat for fun i sent it through the internet they got yeah. back to me with the vocals half an hour later no crazy you know, I, yeah, Mental. I mean, and we've spoken to so many DJs and producers on the show and, you know, sometimes it is the one that they think that, you know, we spoke to Waff and he was saying, I've put something to, I've put something together and I think it's a bit shit sometimes, but it's the fourth track on an EP and suddenly that's the one that, that blows up and it's like, it, there's no rhyme or kind of reason to it and or something that you've made, you know, very quickly in the studio, it's a bit throwaway and that becomes like uh, the big one. It's, you can't, uh, yeah. you can't account for that. Um, I mean, when you're creating material in the studio, how much of a kind of tweaker are you? Do you like to put things in front of an audience when they're half finished and then go back and kind of change them a little bit? Or do you have such self-confidence that you're like, I know this, I've nailed this, I'm just going to play it and that's how it's going to go out? That's depending. I say, you know, sometimes the track comes uh, up in a couple of hours and it's ready mm -hmm. to go. Sometimes I don't even need to mix it on the desk because I, I still usually use all my analog, analog gear. And sometimes, you know, there's been a couple of occasions like um, one of the tracks on uh, on Hot Creations that even if I, I was trying to mix it on a mixer, it was sounding shit. So I kept the left and right on Ableton. Uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm very raw. I, I, I like to play very rough demos as well to the, to the, to the crowd and see how it mm -hmm. reacts. Sometimes I keep the super rough yeah. demo and because it sounds good, it captures <laughs> the vibe. And yeah. I, you know, I, sometimes I do it on the fly, uh, with my headphones on the plane and, and I play it and it, it works and it's like, yeah. you know, good. The first, you know, mm -hmm. the, yeah. and so there's no rule. I'm, but I'm very, I'm very raw on this sort of things, you know, very old school. Yeah. And like sometimes that rawness, that roughness, you know, that that's a real point of difference from, you know, things in the, in, you know, produced in the studio or digitally mainly, you know, can very sound very clean and, you know, crisp. And, you know, I think a bit of rawness, especially thinking back to like, you know, your vinyl days, buying those, uh, those original kind of house tracks on vinyl, they, they had that kind of energy to them, didn't they? 
Yeah, I mean, if you think about the way they were producing mm. them, so, you know, like very cheap mixers or cheap desks or everything all together, maybe sometimes out of sync, you know. Yeah. But it yeah. has a vibe, you know, and uh, it's all about the character in the track as well. Mm -hmm. That's why I say I'm, I'm not a very good engineer. I, I'm, yeah, I mix my own tunes, uh, but it's mainly a matter of taste. I'm not very technical. So every time they ask me to do some uh, meet up with some, you know, some sound engineering tech, you know, schools or whatever uh, producer schools, like maybe mm -hmm. you can teach me more technical things than myself <laughs> because uh, I'm, I'm really self-taught and I yeah. throw all the channels up and if they sound good, you know, yeah. that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm totally of the school of uh, just, just play around until, you know, just learn through doing, um and yeah. yeah again waf was very similar in that like he was like i i don't know how to what compression is or how to eq properly it's like i just press loads of stuff until it sounds good yeah so, like, okay that's <laughs> pretty that's, much that's pretty one way to go um i mean in terms of the the this uh, snatch records label you know um some of the big you've released some of the um tracks from some of the biggest names in in house music i'm thinking of like groove armada robbie rivera michael bibby um i mean in terms of landing those tracks for the label, are you prospecting and having conversations with them or do they just come your way? Is there like a competitive spirit between labels competing to sign particular tracks? Like how does that work in terms of you putting out those ones from the big artists? Um, very easy going. If they want to release on Snatch, you know what they will find. Um mm -hmm. I think Snatch to now, uh, to these days is still considered as a test maker label, mm -hmm. and you mentioned BB. You meant you know uh, I, we had the first release from another. We had the first release from you know early releases from Dennis Cruz, yeah. uh, Solardo, mm -hmm. you name it. You know we had pretty much everyone, uh, and they were at the early stage, so there wasn't much competition because probably. They didn't have that many releases around, you know, like, so, um, you know, uh, the actual competition comes when they start blowing up. So they yeah. just take their own way and they don't care about Snatch anymore. <laughs> but that's fine because our role, uh, the way I see it is that I'd like to release, you know, stuff from, you know, fresh, fresh producers yep. that, uh, you know, they're just now putting their ideas in, in the industry and I feel that those ideas are more fresh and less um, uh, commercially dictated. So yeah. it's when they have their like uh, raw and fresh approach to it. And, uh, and it's easier to deal with them because they are more open to suggestions. And, they, and I, I like to do a and r in the old school way. So if they release on Snatch, it's because they trust my, my uh, taste as well. So sometimes we help them with the... Um, mix down or the stem mastering or some edit mm -hmm. suggestions. If they need a voice, we, we try and get a voice for them. Um, so yeah, but usually I'm easy going, if you don't want to release it on Snatch, sometimes happen that, you know, they realize that they wanted to release on a different label and we had the EP signed already. You're like, fine, if you want it back, take it back. Yeah. Your loss. <laughs> but, <you> know, <laughs> no, but it's fine. I'm, I'm very easy going, really. I use, I use the label not as an ego platform, but more of a lab where I can experiment stuff, launch new people, try things, and release my own shit when everyone else doesn't like it or, you know. <laughs> what a way to look at it. That's, that's brilliant. And, you know, in terms of that new talent that you're working with, how are you finding them? Are they finding you? Are you out there actively prospecting for it? Like, how do they get onto your radar? Yeah, there's several ways. We st I still listen to hundreds of demos every every week, mm -hmm. like probably two, 250 demos every week. Uh, and I listen to everything by myself. So sometimes we find some raw talents um, and we try and develop them, uh, sometimes through friends. Sometimes I find something on Beatport or Traxors and I like, I, and I go deeper into these, the productions. Or I see a video, there's someone that I like that is playing a track that I like and I go deeper into researching. There's always a lot of curiosity involved. So, mm -hmm. and there's no, uh, there's not a rule, a particular rule or some, someone gives me a USB, uh, a party, you know, there's several ways of, you know, doing it. 
Yeah, yeah. And Sometimes, he... like this, my my mom's friend, uh, daughter, boyfriend, who was a producer, <laughs> and I got delivered a, a USB at my mom's house. So when I went to pay visit, she gave me this USB, and it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. I mean. This is this is how it all starts, right? It's, it's sometimes it's yeah. a bit of uh, it's a bit of who you know in that in those early years, um, you know. Into, and and the overarching um, theme of the label, you're saying, you know, a tastemaker label, you know, it's that uh, one where you're actually launching talent. And you know, as as a brand, it's you, you've hosted stages and um, tents at things like Tomorrowland and Creamfields over the years. Um, you know, how are you, how do you curate something like that? How do you bring the talent to perform at that what are you thinking about when you're putting together the the schedule for something like that which is you know a massive huge event that thousands of people are going to be attending yeah and in fact it was too much for me so that's why we're not doing it anymore i <laughs> uh it's it's a totally different uh game and i i'm not sure i want to be involved in it i mm. i'm not a big fan of all the politics that mm-hmm. happen behind the curtains um uh, I, I, I've always liked to talk through uh, with music uh, mm-hmm. and with merit rather than just uh, stepping in with force and politics and stuff. Uh, yeah. So, um, but yeah, the, in that particular time, it was easy because uh, Snatch was like on top of the game uh, in terms of like um, trending label as well. So I had Duke Dumont and Groove. I mean, everyone was coming and yeah. also doing bigger stage. Like we hosted our stage at Tomorrowland as well. So everyone wanted to play there. So it was easy, mm-hmm. whoever I was asking to. Uh, yeah. It's it's a bit the same when you when you sign a big artist on the label, like I signed an EP from Nina Kravitz. And, mm-hmm. um, and I had, you know, Jamie Jones on the remix and uh, Radio Slave and stuff. People, they usually, it's hard to get for yeah. a simple remix you know there has to be some some sort of you know um motivation and it's understandable i would mm. probably um do the same to a certain extent you know if there's so many requests around you end up selecting more so that what i mean is that if there's something that is helping it so like a, as a bigger stage or a big artist who i need the remix for everything gets easier you know and I yeah. don't need any politics and stuff. It's just the music that is talking by itself, itself. Yeah. So yeah, but that, but nowadays I'm not doing that much anymore. Um, mm-hmm. Probably gonna start doing some parties, but it's too stressful and billing and egos and all that stuff. I, I it's not for me. It's, I'd rather spend time for music. Yeah, oh, it's a fantastic attitude to have to 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 be just like no, you know, it's not about me, it's not about my ego, it's about the music. I mean, what's the what's the what's next for the for the label? You know, what what future plans have you got in this space um, in terms of where you want to push it? Well, as I said before, I'm fascinated by the pop world. So what I'm trying to do now, even with Riva, I've done any sort of DJ tool, possible DJ tool, like even in techno with my Hyperloop. Uh, mm-hmm. project uh, on drum code and album and everything so I, I've done pretty much everything and I'll keep doing tools every now and then but what I want to do is step into the more songwriting game and, and, and do more sessions with musicians so I'm going to start mm-hmm. doing more songs I have an album almost ready was it's mainly uh, composed of songs and I'm going to do this project in Napolitan still with this Riva sound uh, with some Napolitan producers they are amazing Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so we're launching this new label uh, soon uh, called Stylos, uh, mm-hmm. Snatch Stylos, which means style in old Greek, uh, okay. which is, you know, obviously um, style is, is important because it's your way of communicating your, your, the dress you give to your communication and your mm-hmm. characteristics and how people will recognize yourself, which mm-hmm. I mentioned as a very important thing, you know, for me. Mm-hmm. And as one of the points that defines success for me, so um, yeah, the first thing will be my album, and it's 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 nice because uh, I'm gonna have as artworks, I'm gonna have artists uh, whose drawings will be part of the artworks. 
okay. for each release. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna have this guy from Margate called David Schillinglow, uh, mm -hmm. who is an amazing um, artist, and uh, he's gonna have one drawing for each release, each single. And we're probably gonna have some exhibitions around the release date of the album. So I'm gonna start, uh, um, you know, like kind of training my A and R skills on, on the you know popular sort of more song based music based mm -hmm. uh, side to it just because i like a challenge and i want to try and do something different as well yeah yeah well Same what date, amazing I'm project. Keep doing you know club stuff uh, uh -huh. but uh, i'm finding myself spending less and less time in that direction and yeah. moving more towards this direction that is giving me more you know thrills and <laughs> and stuff so yeah, yeah that's I mean... the future yeah, absolutely. It sounds like so exciting. I want to talk about uh, remixing as well a little bit just before we move on to the tracks in the in the perfect playlist. Um, you know, recently, um, well, in July, you've uh, had a, a remix released of um, the classic um, Eddie Amador house music uh, released way back on Yoshitoshi, um, you know, over 25 years ago. I mean, that that track, you know, it's still you still hear it out today. Um, you know, what was your relationship with that track? And, and, you know, did you jump at the chance to to remix and put your stamp on it? Yeah, obviously I couldn't say no. And <laughs> uh, even though I knew it would have been super difficult because obviously mm -hmm. it's such a classic. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have this vision of remixing some of the classics that uh, sometimes I need to just totally change the track when I remix, but some of the tracks, they just need a good old refresh. Yeah. And again, is putting your producer ego on the side and put your, um, what you, you know, your skills in a way uh, to the service of the actual track because yeah because that's the, the start of the show, right? So mm -hmm. um, it took me months to make this track, months. Oh, I met Sharam in Colombia at a festival in October or November yeah. even. Uh, and we talked about it, he sent me the stems and I, I was going the, the classic house route with, you know, and I was like, you know, if, if I have to remix this track with the meaning of those lyrics, he has to be the definitive house beat, mm -hmm. but I was never happy about it. Everything was sounding so lame and whatever. And one day I decided to do a disco remix. So why don't I take, because, you know, ultimately he was sampling for a disco he sold for yeah. records. So I was mm -hmm. like, why don't I actually bring it back to that vibe and see how mm -hmm. it sounds? Because that conceptually makes much more sense to me. So I came out with this remix. Um, actually, I have a bootleg remix that I'm playing where I used more vocal samples from the original, more yeah. like the melodic samples mm. uh, that actually gave just to four or five friends. Um, mm. And that would be exclusive forever because we can't release that. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I was sending Sharam this version continually, continuously. And I was like, look, but he was still into this vision of having a house remix. And I was like, look, this is the, this is the one I'm playing. Yes, yeah. there's these 500 house versions I've done, but none of them is uh, as good as this one. And then over the months, I started sending him videos of me playing it, crowd going nuts. And then <laughs> in the end, he was like, fine, let's release this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and people are loving it so uh, mm. i was happy we went for you know that that thing where i actually respected the original yeah. vibe and <clears throat> structure ideas or concept but then i i brought in a different flavor yeah. that was actually you know where the original sample came came from and uh and I'm I'm super happy about it. Super yeah, happy. you should be. It's it's brilliant, and it's it's really interesting that you know you've you've put your ego to one side. You've said to 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 reinvigorate such a such a classic track. Um, you know sometimes, you know you might think you might see on paper like a remix come out, and you're like, oh yeah, I can't wait to hear that. And then you hear it, and it's like, oh no, that that what 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 have they done? They've changed so much of it. You know, um, we've kind of gone the other way. I mean, when you're doing some a, a remix or or a different mix of something that's like like a bit older what what sonic kind of challenges are you having like updating those older things you know we've talked about those older house records being 
uh, done on kind of like you know not very good equipment and things like that you know what uh, what are you trying to change and and how are you trying to beef it up in the studio to to for you know for modern kind of audiences and and sound systems well i always try and do some like more of a it sounds a bit too clever as a word but like a philological sort of research mm-hmm. on the sound mm-hmm. um uh, I don't use this word very often, so no way. Uh, uh, <laughs> we'll allow it. So my uh, my main challenge is to actually uh, create a sound that is uh, modern and as dynamic uh, as the other tunes that are around right now, but still keeping the original rawness and uh, raw approach, mm-hmm. which was the case, for instance, when I did the remix of Tanya. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. from Harry yep. Romero so if you mm-hmm. if you listen to the beat I mean how can you change the edit oh, it's perfect it's you know that, that it's it's just you know all you can do is maybe yeah find some different ideas of that concept mm-hmm. because it's mm-hmm. a concept but then beef up the beat still keeping that rawness and that yeah. wasn't easy as well so it took me several um, attempts to get the beat right same as the needing you remix mm-hmm. uh that i did or when i did the super styling remix mm-hmm. for grandmother that was a big big tune it went number one on beatport for like two months like yeah. non-stop yeah. um and people are still playing it to these days so i'm happy so it's all about finding the right uh balance in between the original concept and you know when you decide to go the updating route mm-hmm. you know yeah, yeah. So, and yeah, there's a lot of research involved and sound testing and, and I have two or three people that I really trust the judgment for for these mm-hmm. things, uh that I connect with and I send them, you know, uh one of which is Santos, because I think mm-hmm. you know yeah. be, be, beside being one of my closest friends and we've been working together for twenty more years now, uh but he's he's very good in understanding, you know, my vibe and suggesting mm-hmm. me the, the good the good direction. My guru. Your guru, that's good. It's always yeah. good to have a guru. Um, yeah. And, you know, the, a lot of the tracks you just mentioned there in terms of remixes and things like that, you know, last year you were invited by Defected to do, to take part in their House Masters um, mix series. And, you know, it's a, like an honor that's bestowed on genuine legends, you know, like yourself now and amongst that, who's it's like Louis Vega, Derek Carter, Armour Van Helden, you know, and the most recent release has been, you know, a retrospective of Frankie Knuckles. Um, I mean, how did you feel when you got that call um, to take part in that? Was it, um, you know, did the ego take I, over a little bit and you were uh, like, this is pretty good? Was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, of course, but I was feeling a bit out of place there. Obviously, you mentioned all those names. I was like, ah. first, that makes me feel old. Second, I, I'm not sure I, I have enough, good enough tunes to fit in there. Uh, but I suppose I was uh, gifted because of the consistency of my body of work rather than mm. having standard. Because obviously uh, my generation uh, comes after most of the legendary people that are there. Not necessarily because I'm younger, because I started later. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, and so some of them are like bona fide classics made early 90s. And, you know, when that happened, you know, even if you do big tracks later on, it's hard to to put them into people's minds as, you know, old school classics. So it's more that they probably considered me as a new school in between the old kind. I, I would I, I don't know how to define. I'm not I don't think I'm old school enough to be considered as old school even mm-hmm. though I started early 2000. But I guess for the new generation, I'm starting to be a bit of the Uncle Riva sort of vibe. Uh, but more about <laughs> the consistency, because I've done a lot and a lot of remixes of classics. So, mm-hmm. uh, so yeah, I, obviously I was happy and uh, well, uh, I dived you know, into it, you know. Absolutely, but, um, an incredible feat. Well done. You totally deserve to be there, in my opinion. And, you know, that that the mix you put together is is sensational considering you know all of um your your own productions and remixes and everything amongst that um you know thanks you, you you're welcome um how was it like pulling together that 
that um, playlist. I mean, considering this is potentially, you know, if new fans are coming on board to the to get involved with the Reva Star, like this could potentially be their starting point. So, did you feel sure. like um, was there some kind of was it difficult to pull it together? And did you feel a weight to kind of get it right, or was it just easy just to let it flow and take it from there? It was a bit hard, actually, consider that usually they have 20 tracks in the compilation and I managed to convince them to do 30. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, I had several tracks even where the, the, I'm really attached to that are connected to my early starts. Mm. That really means a lot for me, but obviously they wouldn't fit in terms of sound. So, and there were so many remixes, so many remixes that I couldn't add for some licensing problems and uh and and also space problems yeah it wasn't easy so mm. i i asked for their help in terms of like you know having someone that is not as attached as me to to the tracks that could suggest me and uh, i humbly accepted the, the final track list even <laughs> though i wanted to add at least 10 15 more tunes but you know yeah well, it was good in do? the end and i'm happy we went for that track list Good, good. And, you know, we're talking about tracks now. I mean, this is the moment in the interview where we're going to talk about the tracks that you've chosen for um, for our House Culture Perfect playlist, which is um, our playlist on Spotify. It's um, I can I, I've got them written down here in front of me as well. So I can remind you if you need me to please to remind yes, you. Please. No worries. Um, yeah, it's on Spotify. Every single guest has uh, submitted five tracks based on different themes to this playlist. So it's absolutely huge now because we've done, you know, over 70 episodes of, of the podcast, which is incredible. Um, so wow. we always st- we always start off with um, a catalyst tune, a tune that, you know, opened your ears and got you into electronic dance music or house music or whatever. And you've chosen, I was so pleased when I saw this come through, you've chosen uh, Beat This by Bomb the Bass. Um, I mean. Talk to me about that. I mean, you know, it's it's one of the tracks they were heavily playing uh, that um, club show on the radio that I was listening when I was young, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, that one, you know, pop up the volume and all that, you know, uh, stuff that was being produced heavy, with the heavy sampling around the time. That was my intro to to everything technical as well. So I was, you know, I kept wondering for years <laughs> after that, how the hell they were actually doing it. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it took me a minute because it wasn't like today that you could just ask Google and you know, or chat GPT and you had all the results, all the answers. Mm. So I had to go through several uh, magazines bought through, you know, uh, through post or, or ordered or asked to friends or whatever. And, you know, so yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, that track was in particular was, you know, amazing. Bomb the bass that, uh, you know, it's, there, it's there. just unreal. Absolutely unreal. amazing. Okay. So a floor filler, um, the next, um on the list you've chosen the river star remix of horny by moose t which is at this point it's unreleased but is it coming out talk to me about is it coming in uh in august yeah uh this is out in september so uh yeah no, yeah it's uh it's out second of august ah brilliant okay so yeah we'll be able to put that in so um talk like moose t horny it's obviously a huge anthem and has been for a long time you know we've kind of touched on this a little bit about how you how you take these things and tackle these things on board you know tell me tell us about like putting this remix together and and what what damage it does on the dance floor to this day yeah i mean i hated uh to put my my tracks in the list but it's the actual track that i'm constantly playing right now you know it's Uh and it's one of those tunes that so figure that out it's even worse than the house music remix because he sent me the stems in 2019 <laughs> so, <laughs> so i've been on and wow. on forever i couldn't find the perfect beat and uh, edits and everything whatever and all of a sudden last summer i i found the right beat and then i forgot about it and then uh around autumn i found the raw recording you know the 24-bit recording and i I worked in a different way there. I, I used the recording of the, the, the master uh, that was flat, and then I added extra beats, re-edited it, and it was the final version. And I started playing, and people were going crazy. And uh, 
and it was incidentally it was the anniversary of Orly, so he wanted to do vinyl, and I'm, that's gonna that's the only version on vinyl and out uh, as a uh, as a remix, and, um, and yeah, that's whatever I played for obvious reasons, you know, girls start screaming and. Um, dance floor starts magically to populate so <laughs> it's the one i pull out when i'm in trouble <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's still an absolute tune so recognizable it's, it's it's awesome and yeah i mean don't be afraid of having put your own things into this list it's you know it's whatever works for you so many of people have, um, have put their own things in this list as well so you're not alone in that there's no yeah. shame or ego in it at all that um, shows that i really love my stuff Absolutely. If anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, okay, so a, a change of pace now. It's a sunsetter, a uh, perfect track to soundtrack a sunset. You've chosen the 100 Birds Beatless remix of, is it Reg? Or oh, it's R-E-J, Reg? By, you uh, know, by I Arme. never understood that. But yeah, Reg or Ray, Ray mm. maybe. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, the original is a masterpiece yeah. uh, on its own. And... This I found that this version really captures the magic of the original and um, spread it on uh, the sunset chill vibe. Mm-hmm. Um, I always like to play it uh, when I do this sort of you know sunset sets and whatever. Uh, obviously, it's hard. There's so many tracks, but this one in particular came to my mind when I read, yeah. read the, the the question. So. And they're amazing musicians, of course. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's got a lovely, like, build to it as well. It really goes places uh, as, you, as you work your way through it. Okay. A tearjerker uh, can be dance music, anything, bring, like, fills you with emotion. Um, you've chosen us. Oh, Larry Heard presents Mr. White, uh, The Sun Can't Compare. I mean, why did that one come into your head? Uh, because uh, I I was finding myself playing it again lately, and uh, mm-hmm. it's such a good song. It's uh it's the perfect track. The track that it's one of the tracks that I wish I had produced. Uh, so simple yet so enhancing in terms of emotions and uh the way it sang. I mean, it has a special place for me. You know, in my um in my music collection and uh, I don't know, it's one of those tracks that for me uh, inspire, inspired those emotions. So mm-hmm. it's definitely in, you know, it cool. earns that position, that place. Yeah, great choice. And, you know, I don't think there's any higher praise, you know, when someone's saying, you know, I wish I'd made that track myself. I think that's a really big compliment you can pay to someone. Um, okay, it's last tune end of the night the crowd are asking for one more uh you've chosen the river star remix of if you wait by london grammar um yeah, again sorry about, about that. that but no, it's actually <laughs> it's actually the track that i uh, that i play every time they ask me for uh, a more chilled end of the the night set uh yeah. tune mm-hmm. uh and that's that's a track that again when i did the remix i wanted to to give it a more raw feel Mm-hmm. And it's one of the tracks that uh, has been bubbling under since I made it, probably 2016 now, mm-hmm. if wow. not earlier. Yeah. Uh, and it's just great because they have those strings and piano arrangements and the voice, oh, the which voice. is <laughs> very, very cool, but also very mm. powerful. And, you know, you know, and, you know, I, I, I still have goosebumps every time I listen to that track mm. and, um yeah and it's one of the tracks that i constantly play uh when i when i finish my set and i like to see girls reactions on it and it's you know it's um it's nice to see how involved they are also in in the vibe um but generally you know people like it and i i still i'm still not bored of it so yeah i will keep on playing until i get bored (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well if you you know sometimes it's about it, something has longevity when you know you, you don't get bored of it isn't it it's uh yeah it yeah. can last for for a long time okay well we've done the last tune this is the last question of the uh of the of the podcast um we are obviously house culture you are on the house culture podcast today and when when we're thinking about a culture and a movement um particularly around 
house music and dance music you know what does the culture of house mean to you what you know when you look at it as a scene including you know personalities crowds people music art fashion all of these things you know what does house culture mean to you well it's fun that you asked me this question because i just uh, launched a playlist called house of freedom which says it all really um for me, you know, house music, you know, what really got me into it is when I say, it, you know, there were these early ones, Stroke and Jesse Rose uh, productions where they were actually putting into the mix, you know, some other styles, vibes, you know, the the, the very sabby road drum and bass, uh, bass lines or the very uh, crispy hip hop snares or whatever, you know, like, and for me, you know, that particular vibe of being open in terms of sounds and uh, and vibe on the music side, and then at least uh, you know uh, when the uh, the house music movement started, you know the welcoming attitude of mm-hmm. each and every person, uh, no matter the color, uh, your sexual orientation, your uh, social class, or whatever, you know, like that the very same vibe, a conceptual reason of you know you know uh, congregating together into a place that was not conceived to be a poshy place to be seen in but just to be lived together uh living behind outside everything else was just so fascinating to me and uh i i still like to think that most of these values are still true nowadays and uh, uh and that people still make house music thinking about some of these values uh, more and less of some of the smoke and mirrors yeah. values that are so trendy mm-hmm. as of today yeah brilliant that's a great summation thank you so much for taking part no today worries.